section of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening from Charleston, I'm Eric Douglas. Tonight on the legislature today, election reform and the high cost of diabetes treatment. Those topics later, but first, as lawmakers reach the halfway mark of the 2022 legislative session, an issue that we saw proposed and then defeated last year, personal income tax repeal, has been successfully resurrected by the House of Delegates. House Bill 4007 would reduce all personal income tax brackets by 10%. After significant debate yesterday and today, the bill easily passed along party lines is now on its way to the Senate. And in the Senate this week, two bills that would result in major changes to the state's unemployment benefit system passed after two hours of sometimes heated remarks. Reporter Liz McCormick shares some of the floor debate that took place Tuesday. Yes, sir. Senator Senate Lewis Bill 2 would reduce the maximum term for unemployment benefits from 26 weeks to 20 weeks. Supporters say it will weed out fraud and create an incentive for people to find a job quickly. But several Democrats rose to oppose the bill, including Senator Owens Brown, a Democrat from Ohio County, who shared with lawmakers he had stood in the unemployment line many times. And how do you make laws uh, determining how many weeks of unemployment they they should get if you yourself have never experienced the unemployment line. And we seem to have an attitude of being more punitive towards the unemployed, like it's their fault that they're unemployed. Brown also says people without higher education will find it more difficult to find new jobs. Senate Bill 2 passed 20 to 14 with some Republicans voting against it. Another bill, Senate Bill 3, would require a person to actively seek work while receiving benefits. Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo, a Republican from Kanawha County, is the lead sponsor of both of these bills. Speaking to Senate Bill 3, he says it creates an opportunity unlike anywhere else in the U.S. No other state has tried to do this, and that is, yes, you can go be getting part-time work while fully getting your full unemployment. No state does that, Mr. President is it helps those people that are in a very scary situation get funded with everything they can do while working part-time jobs, keep their full-time unemployment. Senate Bill 3 would require four specific job search activities a week for those receiving unemployment benefits. Recipients would have to actively register with job sites, apply for training, and take a civil service exam. Those who fail to do this would not be eligible for benefits. Senator Hannah Geffert, a Democrat from Berkeley County, says some people may not have the technology or broadband available to meet some of those requirements. Unemployment insurance is insurance to make you whole. It's not something to punish people. And I don't think most of the people in our state are trying to game the system. They're merely trying to survive and comply with all these rules. Senate Minority Leader Stephen Baldwin of Greenbrier County repeated what he said Workforce West Virginia Executive Director Scott Adkins told lawmakers in committee. The real barriers are child care and transportation. There were a couple of amendments offered that could have helped get at that issue as, as best we could. Um, those were not adopted. If we're concerned about getting folks back to work, let's listen to the facts. Senate Bill 3 passed 23 to 11. Again, Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo. These two are great companion bills. I think it's going to move West Virginia forward. The bills are now awaiting consideration in the House Finance Committee. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick. Democrats held a press conference yesterday calling for the supermajority's support of Democrat-proposed bills, including paid family leave, 
a lower food tax, and a cost of living adjustment for retired state employees. Delegate Kayla Young of Kanawha County added this. We also haven't seen any proposals yet for American Rescue Plan funding. We put forth several proposals for how we think that money should be spent that's going to best help West Virginians, and we just aren't seeing it happen at all. West Virginia has the highest rate of deaths caused by diabetes. These deaths are preventable when diabetics have access to affordable, life-saving medication and devices. As June Leffler reports, lawmakers are considering legislation that would help patients with these costs. Any chronic disease, like diabetes, can take control of someone's life. Mindy Salango says diabetes dictates everything she does in a day. It just really kind of ate at me the other day that my body is never going to function properly and that I always have to fight and stay on top of it to stay alive. To keep her blood sugar in check, Salango wears a device that checks her levels every 10 minutes. And she counts her carbs and injects insulin alcohol. seven or eight Which times a day. She does this to prevent suddenly fainting at her steering wheel or having her daughter have to call the ambulance. She has had to watch me pass out from low blood sugars more times than I care to have had her see, see that. Um, and she's had to, you know, call emergency services you know, to get them to help me because she couldn't wake me up. Not all insurance plans are equal, and the financial costs of the disease can be too much to bear. Salango remembers having to ration her insulin, a risky thing to do. So I would have to uh, not take as much, uh, not eat as much, not eat as often, so that I could pay the bills, have food on the table for my daughter, um, you know, keep our mortgage paid. This is common. One in four diabetics say they have rationed their insulin in the past two years, according to the American Diabetes Association. Gary Dodderty well, is the association's the director of state government affairs. Average, people with diagnosed diabetes have medical costs that are nearly two and a half times that of people who don't have diabetes. The ADA says a diabetic spends on average $9,000 a year treating their disease. The cost of insulin is three times higher than it was 20 years ago. Dodderty says a single vial of insulin can cost around $300. You can quickly see how the more vials of insulin somebody uses, um, how that price, how that cost uh, can climb very quickly and, and sometimes into thousands of dollars. About 16% of West Virginia adults have diabetes and are subject to these costs. State lawmakers have taken notice and acted. In 2020, the state legislature created a law that capped the amount a person could pay for insulin at $100 a month. Democratic delegate so Barbara Evans Fleischhauer brought bill. forward that first um, step. She looked at other states' lives. laws and, and even traveled to Canada with a group of diabetics to purchase much cheaper medications. We um, decided to go to Canada to demonstrate that it didn't have to be the way it is in the United States. Some of the people saved hundreds of dollars that day. And that was sort of to let people know that we could do things differently in West Virginia. But Fleischhauer says there's more to do. This year's House Bill 4252 passed overwhelmingly in the lower chamber. It would drop the price of insulin from $100 a month to $35 a month. It would also reduce the cost of devices diabetics use. It says that you can have an insulin pump every two years for $250. Those pumps, if you had to buy one uh, off the market, are $5,000 to $7,000. And they literally will extend your life by a decade or two. Access to an insulin pump and other technology makes it easier for diabetics to control their illness. And that keeps people healthier and living longer. A West Virginian is more likely to die of diabetes than someone living in any other state. A Cabell County doctor and the bill's sponsor, Republican Delegate Matthew Rohrbach, has seen patients wind up in some of the worst circumstances. Heart attacks, strokes, peripheral vascular disease, amputations, the need for prosthetics because of the amputations, those are all lessened 
if people will keep their diabetes under good control. So this bill is an attempt to at least financially help them do that. If this bill passes, insurance companies will take on the extra costs. But Rohrbach says preventative care is essential to avoiding catastrophic outcomes, both physically and financially. The bill now sits in the Senate's Health Committee. For the legislature today, I'm June Leffler. And now an in-depth discussion on election reform legislation. Both parties have very different perspectives on what is warranted. Curtis Tate sat down this week with Senator Robert Carnes, a Republican from Randolph County, and Senator Richard Lindsay, a Democrat from Kanawha County. Senator Richard Lindsay, Senator Robert Carnes, thank you for joining us today. The goal is to have a secure election process and to encourage uh, an increase in voter participation. And there are a number of voting related bills moving through this session. You both serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee and that's considering these bills. Uh, what do you support? Uh, let me start with uh, with you, Senator Lindsay. Well, yes, uh, I've Senator Caputo and I uh, from the 13th, and I'm from the 8th. We introduced a bill, Senate Bill 200, uh, which has not been taken up in judiciary, but based upon the success of the 2020 cycle, where I believe we had around 62 percent voter turnout, um, I believe that was in large part due to the absentee program provided by the Secretary of State's office as a consequence of COVID. And so what Senate Bill 200 seeks to do is to make absentee balloting available every election cycle, just like it was in 2020, to, to gear up that participation. Um, and then also make voting more accessible. Early voting uh, to include, right now early voting does not include Sundays. My bill would include Sundays. Um, it requires early voting centers at uh, in areas uh, at least one designated early voting center for every 15,000 folks. Um, again, the idea is to uh, do it safely and securely, as the Secretary of State's office did in 2020, um, and to make uh, it accessible uh, and easy for everyone who's interested in, in, take, in participating in our system of government. I think that's what Senate Bill 200 does. Senator Carnes, what about you? Well, I think that um, we all want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate in an election whenever they are, you know, a, a proper citizen and resident of the state of West Virginia. We want to make sure that they have an opportunity to get in and vote. We obviously hope um, through the voter education stuff that the Secretary of State does and, and the local county clerks participate in that as many people are aware, of course, of Election Day and how to participate in the election and so on. But we also have to make sure that we do as much as we can possibly do to prevent people who should not be voting from voting. Because every time somebody who's um, not a legitimate voter votes, they're literally canceling out somebody else's vote. And so, um, you know, we have to make sure that we have secure elections. We have to make sure that we have, uh, you know, safe elections. And, and we have to make sure that, um, you know, as many people as possible, once you establish those parameters, are able to get out and vote. Uh, Senator Carnes, would you support any of these changes that, that uh, Senator Lindsay just described? Well, I, you know, I have some concerns with some of them. Um, in particular, uh, when people say there's not really much fraud associated, for example, with absentee balloting. And we saw in the last uh, you know, election in the primary, um, you know, that we, we sent out ballots all across. First, we sent out ballot requests, and then we sent out ballots all across the state. And, and so in my district, um, I'm aware of during that process, somebody did actually tamper with uh, ballot requests. And so, you know, they were uh, eventually sentenced and so on. Um, I believe the sentencing was more related to mail fraud. But, you know, so we do have um, some very real, and I've seen it very much in my district, attempts at, um, you know, committing fraud during the absentee balloting process. And so whatever we do in that regard, we, we have to make sure that it is secure. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that we've got the checks and the voter IDs and things like that that are part of that process. Um, some of the other ideas, I'll have to admit, I haven't uh, had a chance to really dig into the Senator's uh, Senate Bill 200. I'd be happy to sit with him and, and sort of step through and see if there are things that I can agree on. Because, again, to me, I think what we all want to see is everybody who is an eligible voter, we want them to have the opportunity to vote. Um, but anybody who's not an eligible voter. We want to make sure that we exclude uh, those folks, that they're not tainting the process. Uh, Senator Lindsay, you mentioned Senate Bill 200. Uh, you had, a, uh, I think, a similar bill last year that, that never made it out of committee. Um, wh why haven't these bills advanced? Uh, who Who's opposing these changes that you propose? Well, I, I, you know, I don't really have much control over what ends up on the uh, committee agenda. Um, 
But but I will say this, you know, go, going back to uh, the success of our Secretary of State and Mac Warner and providing, I'm not familiar with the primary of 2020, but I think by all accounts, the 2020 general election was free of fraud. He put his office put together a great election. It was all absentee ballot or absentee balloting was made available to everyone. And we had 62 percent turnout. Uh, now, I, as you know, Curtis, or maybe not know, I'm a Democrat. And in that election, we lost three Democrats in the cycle. So this isn't a partisan thing. I think it I think both sides can agree that the more people to vote, the healthier our democracy is. And we should do everything we can to do so. And I think with under Mac Waters leadership at the Secretary of State's office, he's proven that he can put forth an absentee balloting program that's safe, that's secure, that increases turnout. And I think we should continue down that road and make it available through every cycle. Well, you mentioned, of course, that, uh, that, that you're a Democrat and, of course, Secretary Warner is a Republican. So that there, there is bipartisan agreement on a lot of these issues. I think so. But I think, I think maybe the divergence is that, that there was a concern or there has been concern in other states, I guess, over um, the uh, safety of elections. But that hasn't happened here in West Virginia. And I think that if, if I could critique in any way uh, uh, Secretary Warner, it's that he should, he should take the success of 2020 and move it forward and make it permanent for every cycle you know, that comes hereafter. Well, we do have an election this year, a primary and a general election. Um, you know, wh what are your thoughts on uh, uh, the issues that might come up and, um, you know, what should be done in the, in the legislature to, to fix them? Uh, I, I guess, uh, Senator Carnes, go ahead. And sure. I, and I actually think that's one of the things that we're working on in judiciary right now. And, and again, uh, you know, sometimes when we say, well, it's never happened here in West Virginia. Well, that the mere fact that we've dodged a bullet doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, try to figure out how we can clean things up. So that's one of the bills we're actually actively working on in judiciary relates to making sure that we don't have a flood of outside private money coming in to try to influence not just the elections, because obviously people have a right to do that. But in other states, we saw up to 400 and some odd million dollars going directly to public agencies in, in targeted areas in order to try to influence the outcome of the election. And so that's one of the pieces of legislation we're working on in judiciary because we want to make sure, again, everybody who has a right to vote here in West Virginia gets out and votes, you know, at, if at all possible. On the one hand, on the other hand, we don't want somebody from, you know, Washington or Seattle, uh, you know, California, whatever like that, trying to unduly influence the way elections are operated in the state of West Virginia. So I think Mac Warner's done a great job and this legislation we're working on is that his suggestion is one of the things that we need to do to secure the elections in West Virginia. Is that something to your knowledge that happened during the 2020 election in West Virginia or at any other time? No, and in fact, we had testimony related to that. So the, the answer to the question is, it didn't happen in West Virginia, but our current laws would allow for it to have happened. So again, because of the circumstance of that 2020 election, West Virginia wasn't really seriously considered to be in play from a national political perspective. And so there was no reason for those guys to come in from outside and dump that kind of money in West Virginia, but they could have done it. Nothing in our current laws would have prevented it. So in 2022, we, we want to make sure that it doesn't happen then. In 2024, we want to make sure it doesn't happen then. And the way to do that, and again, this is legislation that's come from the Secretary of State where he's He's seen the potential for what could have happened, and he wants to make sure that it's not given the opportunity to come here to West Virginia. Uh, Senator Lindsay, your response to that? Well, I mean, I, the, the bill that Senator uh, uh, Carnes is referring to, I think, has an amendment pending on the bill. I think both of he and I are, and a lot of the committee members were shocked to hear that someone would try to, uh, private folks would provide funding to, uh, not uh, private funding sources to public entities like the county commission. That's not good. We all agree on that. It didn't happen in West Virginia. There was testimony that's happened in other places. I, I guess the, the, the difference, if you will, between the uh, perspectives of at least the two gentlemen sitting here, I don't want to speak for the parties, is I'm not interested in you know what could happen. What I'm interested in, A, has it happened? If it's not, let's figure out a way to make voting easier and more accessible for West Virginians to express their opinions, um, and, and that's what we should be focused on. One of the things that, that, uh, that I think we're discussing here is early in-person voting, um, you know, how long of a period that, that that should take place, 
and when it starts, when it ends. Uh, Senator Lindsey, what, what do you think is, is the appropriate uh, parameter for that? I think, um, you know, I, I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 10 days, Monday through Friday, or may, maybe Monday through Saturday, but not including Sundays. Um, the, the bill, for example, Senator Manchin's bill in the U.S. Senate makes it 15 days and includes Sundays. Uh, my bill doesn't actually identify a time limit. Senate Bill 200 doesn't identify a time limit. It just says Sunday should be included throughout, so it's a whole week. Um, listen, I, the, the only, the only, I think it's good for people to early vote as long as possible. Obviously, you get to a point of diminishing returns, I think, once you get past that 15-day window. I know last year there was a bill considered. Our county clerks were objecting to it because they were concerned about the if 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 you if you shorten the time period the, the, all the work that has to be done to get everything ready for election day that bill died i don't think it passed i know it didn't pass in the law so i mean i just generally speaking the more time within reason that you can provide folks an opportunity to early vote the better senator carnes what would you say to that well i actually i think 10 days is is probably plenty sufficient um I, and I could be mistaken, but I believe we do actually include voting on Sundays uh, in our 10-day window. Um, and what that means is you have every single day of the week and then a few extra days besides. So whatever your work schedule might look like, you do have an opportunity to get out and vote in that 10-day period of time. I think that you know we did have great turnout in the last election. Some of that obviously would have been due to the increase in absentee voting. But I also think that um, there's really just, uh, it seems to me, as I'm out in my district, there seems to be an increased interest in what's actually happening in the Capitol, in Charleston, and in Washington. And, of course, the more interested the electorate is, the more likely they are to go vote. And so I think anything, again, that we can reasonably do, whether it's from the county clerk perspective or the legislative perspective and so on, to make sure that people are very much aware of uh, you know, when Election Day is and when that early voting period is and so on is a good thing. Uh, so, Senator Carnes, uh, Senator Lindsey just mentioned uh, Senator Manchin's bill in Washington. Um, there was once overwhelming bipartisan consensus that Congress had a role in ensuring fair and free elections across all the states. They renewed the Voting Rights Act uh, in 2006 by a, by a pretty large margin. What role should Congress have? Well, the, the U.S. Constitution, I believe, uh, essentially says that the, the elections are actually to be held by the states. Now, I think that when we're talking about discrimination, uh, you know, against particular groups of people, that the federal government does have very much a, a, a responsibility to step in in certain cases like that. But overall, I believe the Constitution uh, designates the states as the arbiters of, uh, you know, the, the holders and the managers of the election process. And so I think that the federal government should be only involved to the extent that it's necessary to ensure that people aren't being denied their their you know franchise their right to vote in a, in a free and fair manner um, and so you know when we look at for example in 2020 or 2018 or 2016 i don't think in west virginia we have a serious problem with people being denied the right to vote based on you know whether what their sex is or what their race is religion etc people are are not being hindered from voting in the state of west virginia currently um, and so I, I think that the federal government actually doesn't have a legitimate role in trying to step in and control the day-to-day -day operations of our elections as long as, as, long as that uh, you know, requirement's being satisfied. Uh, Senator Lindsay, your response? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the Voting Rights Act recently, as, as your viewers know, in a, in a recent Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court opinion, was uh, gutted to the extent that preclearance was taken out. What's preclearance? Preclearance uh, was an opportunity to review any election laws passed in uh, states that had a history of racism or had a history of keeping people from the polls. Um, I thought that was a bad decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court, I think that there should be some review. I think that the goal should be to, is to get it right, whatever it is. Uh, as far as Senator Manchin's bill, you know, it, it mirrors a lot of what we have here in West Virginia. Uh, for example, it has a requirement of voter ID or identification of vote. That's here in West Virginia. There's probably no disagreement between the two of us on that. So uh, I think that it's a good bill. I hope it gets its day in front of the U.S. Senate, and I hope they, they push it forward and, and pass it into law. Well, we're, we're going to have to continue to follow these election-related bills uh, in West Virginia and in Washington. Uh, thank you, Senators, both for your perspectives today. Thank you, thank Curtis. You. Thank you. Thank you.
please tune in again next Friday evening for continuing coverage of the 2022 legislative session. But remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting is covering the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our website at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and the Senate on the West Virginia channel, and we stream those on our website. The Legislature Today is simulcast on both television and radio every Friday night at 6. I'm Eric Douglas. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, building futures close to home at campuses in Morgantown, Kaiser, and Beckley. Information at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com.